appreciate everybody's patience as we dealt with some uh, computer technical issues here. So uh, welcome to uh, the webinar here today. My name is Matt Kissling. I am a partner in Thompson Hines Labor and Employment Practice Group in our Cleveland office. I'm also delighted to introduce my labor and employment colleague also presenting today, uh, our associate Mike Myers, who's based in our Cincinnati office. Uh, for the next hour or so, we are going to be discussing some of the latest trends and developments related to hiring practices, including pay transparency issues, uh, artificial intelligence use in recruiting and hiring, and federal and state restrictions regarding pre-employment inquiries and testing. Just a few preliminary housekeeping items. Uh, today's program is being recorded, and we will send a link to all attendees, including the PowerPoint within roughly 48 hours of when we conclude today. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the question box located in the control panel on the upper right side of your screen. And we'll answer as many of the questions as we can at the end of the webinar, although we do have a, a significant amount of material that we're going to be going through today. And so if there are any questions we're not able to get to, we'll make a point of uh, following up with, with you after, after we conclude here today. So thank you for your interest and your patience uh, as, as we dealt with some technical issues, and now we're ready to get started. So jumping right in, uh, I'm going to spend a, a few minutes talking about the current state of pay transparency requirements in the hiring process. So I always find it helpful to really talk about first, what exactly is pay transparency? How is it defined? And from an overall perspective, this is you know considered to be an employer practice of being open about compensation and pay practices to employees and job candidates, as well as protecting employees who discuss compensation amongst themselves. It's generally recognized as a key step towards achieving pay equity in the workplace. And, you know, from across the board from employer to employer, the degree of pay transparency efforts and disclosures can vary. You know, some you know, typical questions we typically see are, should we disclose specific salary or the specific hourly range for a position? Or should we talk of, you know, more disclosed expected salary range or hourly uh, wage range for the position? And what about other forms of compensation and benefits? What I can tell you is that the you know, particular approach that you know, an employer might take you know, can depend on your organizational preference, as well as you know, the requirements of any applicable federal, state, or local laws. So with that said, I wanted to you know, spend, spend a few moments talking about the legal landscape uh, of pay transparency. And really, it can take several different forms across federal, state, and local law. You know, we see pay transparency non-discrimination provisions, uh, payer salary history bans, uh, salary wage uh, disclosure requirements, and finally, everyone's favorite topic, uh, pay data reporting. So from a non-discrimination perspective, you know, the, these types of you know, uh, requirements you know, typically prohibit employers from taking adverse action against employees or applicants who inquire about their own compensation or the compensation of others, uh, discuss their own compensation or the compensation of others, or uh, disclose their own compensation or the compensation of others. So as you can imagine, these, these non-discrimination provisions are, are pretty broad in terms of their protection to employees. You know, and are there, there are some limited exceptions that exist for folks who have access to confidential or personal pay information of other employees as part of their job duties. So think of someone who handles payroll, think of someone in human resources, you know, under, under these non-discrimination provisions, you know, those individuals who disclose confidential pay information that they're entrusted with as part of the day-to-day -day job duties aren't necessarily going to be protected under these non-discrimination laws. So, and, you know, the, the second area of pay transparency we really see are, and is really a growing area, is in the world of payer salary history bans. And what these laws typically do is they prohibit employers from asking about or using a candidate's pay history to make a hiring decision or set compensation for a new hire. This prohibit, prohibition usually applies to both the job application being submitted as well as any subsequent interviews or discussions. Basically, you can't ask about or use a candidate's pay history at any point in the selection process. And some of these bans also actually prohibit employers from taking an adverse action against a candidate, such as not moving them forward in the selection process because they refuse to provide their pay history when asked. And what I can say, there are some exceptions where certain jurisdictions do provide an exception that will allow you to use pay history information only if the candidate voluntarily discloses it without any prompting by the employer. And so if the candidate simply, you know, volunteers are what, what they're currently making you, and you haven't asked about it or otherwise prompted them to, to provide that information, 
in certain jurisdictions, you're then allowed to use it. What I can tell you is that's the exception and not the norm under these payer seller history ban laws that are currently in place. You know, another area where we're seeing growing movement is in the arena of salary and wage disclosure laws, where I already you know, touched upon this. These are laws that require employers to disclose the expected salary or wages for an open position. And these laws take you know, tend to take different forms and provide different options. You can either disclose the actual specific salary or wage rate for the job, or you know, more commonly, you can see you can see requirements where you disclose a salary or wage range that you as the employer in good faith you know, believe will be paid for the job. Usually these disclosures need to be made on the job description itself. You know, certain laws also you know, require to be provided if a candidate asks for it at any point during the selection process. And some laws also require other compensations such as commissions or bonuses and benefits uh, that may need to be included in the disclosures themselves. And I'm gonna go through a few examples of you know, state laws and what their particular requirements are in a few slides. And I just want to spend a couple seconds just talking about the fourth area of pay transparency, and this is in the in the area of pay data reporting. So under state law, there are currently only two states that require some form of uh, pay data reporting for employers. California was the first, which has been on the book since I believe 2021. And for those of you who have operations in California, the deadline for current year reporting is coming up is in early May. So if it's not something you started the process on, recommend doing so. The other state that currently has something on the books is Illinois, and there it's it's a bit more um, broad in what in what types of pay data need, needs to be reported. Now there are a few other states that have uh, similar requirements in place, uh, but they're typically limited to organizations that actually do business with the state government or a local government, so state contractors. Minnesota is a good example there. Now from a federal perspective, you know. Some of you may remember the uh, what we call the EEO1 Component 2 pay reporting that took place back in 2019. The EEOC, or at least the current EEOC, is widely expected to bring this back in, in the coming year or so. And if you recall, what this did was it required all employers subject to EEO1 reporting to submit reports of summary employee pay data, with that data broken down by individual EEO1 groups, pay bands, and race and gender categories. Now, reading the tea leaves, the EEOC identified pay data reporting analysis as a key goal in its 2020 equity action plan. And at least two commissioners from the EEOC, both Charlotte Burroughs, the chair, and Keith Sonderling, a commissioner, have both signaled that the component two is going to come back to life. And uh, Chair Burroughs actually reaffirmed this at an ABA conference that I attended about a month ago, uh, where she, that this was an issue that came up. Now, interestingly enough, Looking back to the old reports, in mid-March of this year, the EEOC actually released a data dashboard from that prior collection cycle that showed the overall statistical results broken down by race and, and gender categories, and really showed you know what type, what protected groups you know statistically are getting paid more across the board compared compared to other protected groups. So this is something to pay attention to. The EEOC is expected to bring this back at, at a federal level. So outside of pay data reporting, what's the current legal landscape under federal law for other pay transparency? The short answer is there's no current federal pay transparency laws that generally apply to employers. Now, there are some limited exceptions for government contractors and, and subcontractors. This includes the pay transparency non-discrimination provision, as well as a more recently proposed uh, rule under the uh, federal acquisition regulation, which I'll, which I'll touch upon briefly. Now first, you know, from pay transparency, the, uh, the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs has had this non-discrimination provision in, in, in effect for a number of years now. What it does is it requires contractors to post a provision at all physical facilities. A copy of the provision also needs to be incorporated into any employee handbooks and manuals. And you actually also need to post an electronic version on your online careers page. You know, at the same point in time when you post you know, your EEO1 posters and other required posters for candidates uh, to, to view. And, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, what this non-discrimination provision does is it basically prohibits a contractor from taking any adverse action against employees who discuss their own pay or the pay or the pay of others. Now, an, a newer development is under the Federal Acquisition Regulation, where the, they issued a proposed rule on January 30th, and what it does is it seeks to add a new provision to the regulation that will pro prohibit federal contractors and their subs from seeking an applicant's compensation history requiring disclosure of any compensation history or relying on such information, 
even if voluntarily disclosed during the hiring process. It will also require covered contractors to disclose uh, some pieces of information on any job posting for a position that's either directly working on the government contract or in the broader sense is you know, working in connection with the covered government contract. And I can tell you the Department of Labor typically takes a very broad interpretation of what being in connection with a government contract is. And what must be disclosed is the applicable wage or salary or the good, a good faith range thereof that the contract originally believes will be paid uh, for that position, as well as a general description of benefits and other compensation. So from a federal perspective, you know, this proposed FAR rule doesn't really set any geographic limitations on where it applies or who must use it. What it really does is it seeks to impose a nationwide salary history ban, as well as a nationwide pay disclosure requirement for federal contractors and their subs. While it's still in the proposed rulemaking stage, the uh, notice and comment period did end on April 1st. So we expect uh, the FAR Council to take back all the, I'm sure, the plethora of comments they received and sometime in the coming months issue a proposed final rule, which would then kickstart the process for this particular requirement to go into, into effect. So at a state, the state level, there are currently 17 states that we're aware of that have current salary history bans in effect. Nine states currently have salary or wage disclosure laws in effect, and six states plus the District of Columbia have proposed or pending salary or wage disclosure laws that, that we expect to be coming into effect in the, in, in the coming years. So from a current perspective, you know, some of these states are the ones you expect to see, you know, California, Colorado, uh, Connecticut, uh, Hawaii is the newest state to the party, and then Maryland, Nevada, New York, Rhode Island, and Washington all have some form of pay disclosure requirements in, in effect. Now, from a proposer pending perspective, the District of Columbia is going to be the next one to join the party on June 30th, and then Illinois will be next in line on uh, January 1st of 2025. Now, you see Connecticut listed a second time. They've actually Their legislature is actually considering an amendment to their current law that would impose additional salary range disclosure requirements for job applicants job postings in that state. And we're also seeing legislative movement in Massachusetts, Michigan, New Jersey, and Oregon. So as you can see, the, the, the number of states that are rolling out these disclosure requirements are, is in, are increasing, and we expect it to, that the cycle to continue in, in the coming months and years. But from a local perspective, it, it's a, you know, pretty interesting. The, the types of cities and localities that currently have salary history bans and wage and disclosure requirements on the books. Here in Ohio, three cities, Cincinnati, uh, Columbus and Toledo all have salary history bans in effect. And then, as you would expect, New York City, San Francisco currently have laws in place, Kansas City, Missouri, Philadelphia, and then a number of counties in the state of New York. Uh, from a wage disclosure perspective, Cincinnati and Toledo both have their own requirements uh, on, in place. And then Jersey City, uh, New York, Ithaca, and Westchester County all require some form of salary or wage disclosure for job postings that are for you know openings in, in those jurisdictions. So let's look at a few examples here. So New York is, is a great example. Until Hawaii went into effect, this was the most recent law that, that came onto the books. And this took effect in September of last year. And what it does is it requires all employers to disclose uh, all the following for any job opening, promotion, or transfer uh, opportunity. You need to provide the job description itself, which as you can imagine is pretty important. Uh, employers need to provide a salary or hourly rate or a range of the minimum and maximum potential salary or hourly rate for the position. And if an employee is going to be paid on a commission basis, a statement that can confirm that this is a commission eligible position. And importantly, this applies to any job opening that can be performed at least in part in the state of New York. And so if you're in a, a state that is within close proximity to New York and you allow you know, employees to work hybrid or remotely, this is a law you may need to be thinking about. You know, a similar front, Colorado had a law that took effect in January of 2021, and that was amended in June of last year. And this, and Colorado requires all employers to disclose all the following for any job posting that may be performed in Colorado. Like with New York, the hourly rate or the salary or the range of, of either that you would reasonably expect to offer for the job, a general description of any bonuses, commissions, or other compensation being offered, a general description of all benefits, that are gonna be offered for the position and the date the application window is expected to close. Now, from Colorado's perspective, their Department of Labor has expressly stated that this law applies to remote jobs that can be performed in the state of Colorado. 
that takes us to, to a, a quick hypothetical we're going to look at. So uh, apologies for the lack of a creative name here, but Thompson Design is a headquarter in Cleveland. Prior to COVID-19, TD required all employees to physically work at its headquarters office five days a week unless travel was required. As a result of the pandemic and to compete in the current competitive labor market and attract top talent, TD has shifted to a more flexible work policy. It now approves employees to work remotely and actively recruits new candidates for remote positions, subject to periodic travel to the Cleveland headquarters, particularly in the summer months where it's actually nice here. Uh, TD advertises this remote work policy on its job advertisements. Now, TD has a new opening for a graphic designer position, and while the position will report into Cleveland headquarters, and require travel to Cleveland for one week every uh, fiscal quarter. The position is otherwise a full-time remote job. Now, the company is willing to hire a qualified candidate who lives outside of Ohio and has previously hired fully remote employees who live in numerous different states. Now, TD is preparing to release a job posting and open the requisition. So the question here is, is TD required to comply with New York or Colorado's pay transparency disclosure requirements? Is the answer A, yes, because TD is required to include pay range information on all of its job postings. B, yes, because TD has allowed other employees to work remotely outside of Ohio. Uh, C, yes, because TD plans to allow the designer position to be a remote position. Or D, no, because TD does not have a physical location in New York or Colorado. And if you'd like to take a crack at what you think is a correct answer, please feel free to, to post it in the chat box. In this situation here, the, the best answer is going to be C. Yes, TD is required to comply with New York or Colorado's uh, disclosure requirements because it allows, it plans to allow the designer position to be a remote position. If you look back to what the Colorado DOL says, they specifically say their pay disclosure requirements apply to remote jobs that could be performed in the state of Colorado. And New York, we expect to take a similar approach based on their DOL's interpretation of, 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 of their pay disclosure laws. And so here, because TD could foreseeably hire someone or consider a candidate who lives in the state of New York or the state of Colorado, both of those state uh, DOL agencies would expect TD's uh, job posting to comply with their, with their own pay disclosure requirements. So as you can see, the web of these state laws, you know, can expand uh, uh, pr pretty quickly. So continue that, you know, that hypothetical, let's say TD is mindful of its requirements under state laws, and so it's included the following information on the job posting. The expected comp for this position is $80,000 base salary plus a competitive annual performance bonus. Uh, TD also offers a comprehensive employee benefits package, and further information can be found here at, at, at this website. So here the question is, you know, does the job posting satisfy New York and Colorado law. Is it no, TD is required to post a wager salary range for the position? Yes, the job posting includes the expected salary and bonus eligibility and also includes a hyperlink to a description of the benefits package. Or D, no, TD needs to include the, a full description of its benefits package on the job posting itself. Now here, the best answer is, oops, is actually going to be uh, the second one, yes, uh, this would comply with New York and Colorado because it includes that hyperlink to a description of the benefits package. And what most of these you know, state laws say is that while you need to provide you know, certain information about benefits, you know, in, in lieu of listing it on the job, app, job posting itself, employers can actually just include a hyperlink to a general page on your, on your career's website that provides that information. And that will likely satisfy the requirements of you know, state or local law. So with, the, with these uh, legal requirements in mind, what we ask ourselves, what what steps can we take? What's next? So you know, a few you know re recommended you know practical points are first, it's important to monitor your current uh, recruitment practices. So ask questions, you know, where are we currently soliciting candidates? Are we doing so on a local, regional, or national basis? You know, what's our approach, our philosophy towards remote work? Are there any limitations we want we want to put on that? And what information are we seeking from candidates, on, both on the application as well as and during the interview process itself, you know, with, with an eye towards, are we potentially asking questions that could solicit uh, salary history information that we wouldn't, they're not, we're not supposed to be asking about and that we're not per permitted to consider. It's also important, and as part of the normal course of business, to you know, consider updating our job descriptions. You know, first we should always be looking at 
Are the essential duties, physical, mental job qualifications, and other information accurate and up-to-date for the position? Uh, do, the, do the pay and benefits information satisfy any applicable legal requirements? And if we're using salary or wage ranges, are they accurate and realistic for the position at issue? And are they are we determining the salary and wage rate, wage ranges in, in good faith? You know, you know, considering those pay ranges, you know, how so questions to ask ourselves is you know, how can we effectively compare positions you know, to establish pay ranges? What what are what are the similarly situated groups that we're going to look to? You know, what is the, what does the marketplace look like? You know, what are others paying for similar jobs? You know, obviously, we want to try to be as competitive as possible, but also don't want to necessarily bake the, uh, break the bank if we don't have to. You know, how do we account for geographic locations, particularly if you know we, we're, we're an employer that you know, has a flexible uh, hybrid or, or remote work policy? And what's the hiring range for a position uh, versus the internal pay range in and of itself? So you know, the hiring range does not need to be a spot on match the internal pay range. It could be potentially be at the lower end of what your internal pay range is, you know, because obviously you want to factor in opportunities for advancement and subsequent pay increases, and not necessarily something you need to pay right off the bat. It's also important with, with policies and you know, our prepare managers and our hiring personnel. Again, you know, have we communicate what our stances on, or philosophy on compensation, on pay transparency? Do our managers hiring personnel recruiters, do they understand how pay is determined? Can they effectively explain pay ranges or practices to both candidates and, and employees who ask about it? Um, do they understand, importantly, what they can or cannot ask an applicant you know, during during the selection process, both from a comp perspective as well as you know any other you know, potential as we call no-no questions that could solicit protected information? Now, how should we handle pay information that is voluntarily disclosed during the hiring process? Is this something we want to manage on a, on a state-by-state basis, or just adopt you know an across-the-board policy about how we're going to handle that information? And finally, how do we address employee requests uh, for, for new for pay information? You know, both current employees as well as you know candidates who, who are asking about it during the hiring process. So as you can imagine, you know this, this ever-changing spectrum of the pay transparency laws, you know, does require does force us to have, you know ask ask a number of questions and really does provide a, a prime opportunity to reassess our own hiring processes to make sure we're doing everything in a legally compliant manner, but also in a way that makes sense for our organization. So I'm now going to turn it over to to Mike, who's going to uh, transition to a, another area of, of the hiring process and talk about res current restrictions on pre-employment inquiries and testing uh, d during the hiring process. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, Matt, can you, you hear me okay? I can, yes. Awesome, great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Mike Myers. I'm an, uh, a managing associate down in the Cincinnati office in the uh, labor and employment practice group. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the updates in the law with respect to a couple of issues, and we'll we'll get started with uh, background checks and and start with the uh, the federal law and kind of give you an overview of what's going on in that landscape. Um, Congress did pass uh, the Ban the Box Act in uh, became effective in 2021, uh, and essentially this prohibits uh, federal agencies and some federal contractors from asking about applicants' criminal history uh, until after uh, a job offer has been made. There are obvious exceptions, uh, law enforcement officers and, and things like that, where that information would certainly be a little more relevant at the beginning. Um, but uh, currently there aren't any federal regulations that prohibit prior employ um, sorry, private employers uh, from uh, requiring background checks or obtaining uh, criminal history during the background uh, process, the application process. Um, it's important to uh, keep in mind that there aren't any federal regulations that prohibit uh, an individual status uh, from being used as the basis for rejection of that candidate, um, but it is also important to, to remember that employers still have to comply with all of the uh, disclosure and authorization requirements related to the uh, Fair Credit uh, Reporting Act. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, our friends at the EEOC have their own take on the background check issue. Um, it's a, somewhat inconsistent. They start with um, a recommendation that employers uh, don't ask about convictions on job applications at all. Uh, their guidance indicates that using this information could uh, lead to discriminatory hiring practices. They don't really get into specifics as to why that is. Um, 
but then they, they kind of go on to further make another recommendation that if employers are going to make such inquiries, uh, limit the convictions uh, essentially in a way that, that you could justify it from a, a business necessity uh, perspective. Um, but as we, we talked today, there, there's currently no uh, status, um, protected class status with respect to uh, criminal history. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. Now, each state is able to make their own requirements and they do. Um, I've just put up a list of, of several states um, that some of them have no restrictions at all uh, when it comes to asking about uh, criminal history um, and background checks. Um, and some of them, most most states provide some form of restriction. Uh, Colorado uh, can't do a background check until uh, an applicant is listed as a finalist. Um, most of them are um, restricted in a, in a similar manner, uh, but we're going to talk about uh, the two the two most restrictive here uh, on the next coming slides. So New York passed the uh, Fair Chance Act, um, and it is one of the most restrictive in the country. Uh, employers can't place job ads uh, that even mention uh, arrests, convictions, having a clean record, uh, no felons, or, or even that a background check would be required. Uh, you can't ask about criminal history until after the job offer, which is, is similar to uh, other states. Uh, but even then, uh, employers must follow a specific process uh, set forth by the New York Department of Human Rights. So the New York Department of Human Rights is, is essentially the governmental body that uh, oversees a lot of this uh, process. And there are also uh, several codifications uh, located throughout New York's uh, labor law. And so before making a final uh, decision, the employer, they have to do three things. Um, give the applicant a copy of the background check that they uh, used or the, the one that they obtained. Um, and they have to evaluate the candidate by considering specific factors uh, and share a written evaluation with the candidate. And they have to hold the job open for at least three business days uh, after the employer uh, communicates his decision to the applicant so that uh, the applicant can respond to the employer and uh, try to uh, you know, convince them otherwise if it's a, a, a negative if the if the applicant is is rejected, uh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, and so the employer also has to consider uh, these additional factors. Uh, New York public policy uh, encourages employment of people with criminal records. Uh, you have to look at the specific job responsibilities and the duties. Um, you have to take a look at um, whether the the criminal record would have an effect, a negative effect, on the ability of the individual to actually uh, do the job, uh, look at the amount of time that has passed uh, since the criminal conviction, how old were they, uh, the seriousness of the record, uh, and then the candidate can actually submit positive information, um, and you can see there that uh, it can include evidence of school and job training, counseling, uh, and all those sorts of things, so employers have to, to take this into consideration before uh, making a final decision. Go ahead, Matt. Um, and so after that, taking that into consideration, uh, then the employer uh, can decide not to hire a candidate, but it has to be based on uh, one of these two reasons. Um, the direct relationship, so that analysis, both of these analyses are, are going to be pretty general. And so uh, the direct relationship, there has to be one, there has to be a direct relationship between the conviction and the job that uh, the individual applied for, um, or you can uh, reject the candidate if the uh, history creates an unreasonable risk to people or property. Um, those terms are pretty broad, and so they're going to be analyzed on, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and again, the employer must uh, send its reasoning in writing to the uh, applicant after they've made uh, their decision. Uh, the bottom line is you have to proceed carefully uh, in New York when it comes to, to background checks and criminal convictions because uh, the Division of Human Rights essentially creates a presumption of discrimination unless the employer can can demonstrate otherwise. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just interject quickly. I've, I've handled a number of 
these types of complaints before the Division of Human Rights involving criminal history discrimination. It is a very tough claim to defend as an employer. You know, it's never a good a starting point to go in the door with a presumption of guilt. And their investigators tend to be very aggressive in challenging any attempt to, to justify uh, a disqualification based on a, a criminal uh, conviction history. Good point. Thanks, Matt. Uh, and so California, uh, they also have a very restrictive uh, background check uh, process. Um, they implemented their first iteration of their Fair Employment uh, Act in 2018, uh, and it specifically says that it is an unlawful employment practice uh, to even seek the disclosure of an applicant's criminal history until after the application or after the applicant uh, has received a conditional offer of employment. So essentially, the California legislature uh, makes even seeking a background check at the wrong time equivalent to a discriminatory hiring practice. Uh, in 2023, they uh, amended the act and included all kinds of additional uh, requirements uh, associated with uh, background checks and, uh, and conviction histories. Uh, the employer is required to perform uh, individualized assessments uh, they must consider the three things there, nature and gravity of the offense, the time that has passed, and the nature of the job held. So it's kind of similar to New York in that regard. Um, and, and they uh, have that additional requirement at the bottom. You can see uh, the reassessment. So the employer actually has a duty to reconsider an applicant uh, based on evidence that uh, the applicant can submit. Uh, and it has six six requirements there uh, in the interest of time. I don't think we need to go through all of those, but if you're you're curious, you can certainly uh, follow up and, and we can get you more detail on that. And again, there's more regulations out of out of California. California is one of those states uh, that updates its labor laws probably as we're as we're talking right now. So this list could get get longer as we're as we're we're speaking. Um, and so again, we kind of can jump through this. If you if you want more information about what the specific requirements are, just just let us know, and we can we can get them to you. Uh, best practices with respect to to California employees or in general, uh, stay updated with uh, the local laws, the state laws, because even some some local laws have uh, their own intricacies that um, add more requirements on employers. Um, the biggest thing I think take away from this is if you're considering hiring remote employees you know, who live in these states, you're going to have to to abide by uh, the locality's uh, requirements, and so you need to to stay updated on that. Um, refresh your your procedures as you grow and as you uh, add more remote employees. If you use a third-party vendor, you're going to have to make sure you you hold them accountable for those uh, compliance problems. Um, and it's important to, to make sure that your procedures are applied consistency, uh, consistently. If they aren't, uh, you're going to run into more, more problems. Um, if you're in doubt, contact uh, some Labor and Employment Council, uh, and they can set you on the right path. Next topic we're going to talk about is, is drug testing. I think um, you know the way that the current landscape is. Uh, this is going to be become more and more uh, of an issue as, as time goes on. I know we're seeing it a lot more uh, in our practice. And so, again, we'll start with the, the federal requirements. Uh, there's there's no requirement for most private employers to have uh, a drug-free workplace uh, policy, really of any kind, uh, including pre-employment drug screens. Uh, obvious exceptions uh, occur, and uh, there's also safety considerations that you need to make sure you're aware of uh, when it comes to to pre-employment drug screening and even you know current employment drug screening go ahead matt so we're in a, a situation right now where marijuana is is the big one so most states i think have legalized some form of of marijuana um, some of it is there's no prohibition whatsoever uh, some of it you can be used for medicinal purposes and things like that, but it is still uh, illegal at the federal level. So uh, there's kind of this push 
back and forth between the states and the, and the federal government with with how to to manage the situation and, and when that happens each state each locality comes up with with their own um, set of guidelines and laws that that surround that so we'll take a look at some of those um, yeah again we'll talk about new york uh, employers are prohibited from testing current and prospective employees for marijuana. There are a couple of exceptions to this uh, with respect to first responders and, and things like that. But for the most part, that's that's where uh, New York lands. Uh, Nevada employers are prohibited from rejecting an applicant based on uh, positive marijuana test results. Uh, and then in the city of Philadelphia, most employers are, are prohibited from requiring prospective employees to undergo testing for the presence of marijuana as a condition of employment. So this is a good illustration of you, you have to look not only at the state level, but also uh, at the municipal level, because sometimes uh, municipalities have their own uh, requirements and uh, with respect to, to drug testing. New York labor law uh, prohibits discrimination for the legal use of cannabis outside the workplace and during uh, non-working hours essentially treats it like uh, treats it like alcohol uh, it generally bars employers from testing uh, unless they show some articulable signs of impairment uh, it's similar to the uh, reasonable suspicion uh, signs and symptoms i mean they have to be objective objectively and observably impaired while at work um, you know Again, those cases are going to be treated on a case-by-case -case basis because those uh, those terms can be uh, very broad in scope. The practical impact is essentially it eliminates pre-employment drug testing uh, for marijuana in New York. California has uh, similar similar laws. Uh, it protects the rights of uh, recreational marijuana users outside of work and. At times when marijuana use will not affect their work performance, it makes it an unlawful uh, discriminatory practice for uh, an applicant or an employee who has engaged in a lawful use of marijuana outside of work. And it also prohibits employers from relying on tests that measure only cannabis uh, metabolites rather than active THC. So there's different testing methods that they're coming up with to try and determine essentially you know, how impaired is somebody and when was the last time they used, how much did they use, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and this just took effect uh, January of this year. Go ahead, Matt. So where can we test? Um, state law, again, governs uh, which parties can collect specimens, conduct the actual testing of the uh, specimens. Many states do require employees to use uh, a medical review officer in the testing process. Uh, the laboratory then determines what's in the sample, uh, but uh, the MRO must establish essentially how it got there. And so if a candidate tests positive um, and claims that they have a medical marijuana card, just know the rules of your state. So for example, in Ohio, uh, doesn't require employers to uh, accommodate employees who use medical marijuana and employee employers are free to treat it at however they choose. So uh, look to your policy, look to your uh, local ro local rules, local laws, uh, and see uh, see what the, what the deal is there. Uh, you can engage in the interactive process. We recommend that you engage in the interactive process under the ADA uh, to address uh, the underlying disability, just as you as you normally would with with any other uh, claim of, of you know, disability. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for me. Back to you, Matt. Yep, so obviously, I think you know, Mike and I could probably talk uh, for a full hour, hour and a half about all the different intricacies of uh, drug testing and potential you know, landmines that you as employers may be facing as you try to implement effective uh, drug testing programs. If you uh, do recall, we did uh, have a webinar specifically related to drug testing back in February. So if you'd like more information, you know, please I take a look at our website. I believe I believe the the webinar presentation is currently up there. We'd also be happy, certainly happy to answer any questions relating to your drug testing programs offline. So I'm going to wrap this up today with uh, talking about a an ad another growing area of interest from a uh, employment regulation perspective, and that's uh, specifically related to artificial intelligence and its use in the employment uh, selection and hiring process.
So it's certainly helpful to actually talk about what the heck is artificial intelligence. So for guidance, we're gonna look at federal law here. So under federal law, artificial intelligence is considered to be a machine-based system that can, for a given set of human-defined objectives, make predictions, recommendations, or decisions influencing real or virtual environments. Now, AI systems uh, use machine and human-based inputs to perceive real and virtual environments, abstract such perceptions into models through analysis in an automated manner, and use model uh, inference to formulate options uh, for information or action. So basically, you know, using an automated, you know, computer-based or system-based process to potentially replace certain aspects of the human decision-making process. You know, a few other key terms to think about here is an AI model, which under federal law, including uh, you know federal law as well as a, an executive order uh, issued by President Biden last October, an AI model is a component of an information system that implements AI technology and uses computational, statistical, or machine learning techniques uh, to produce outputs from a given set of inputs. Then an AI system is considered to be any data system, software, hardware, application, tool, or utility that operates in whole or in part using artificial intelligence. So as you can imagine, that's a pretty broad definition of, at least from a federal perspective, what, what we consider to be artificial intelligence or an AI system. Now, I'm gonna borrow from a more local law in New York City to talk about a similar term. It's called what's called an automated employment decision tool. And under New York City law, this is considered to be a computational process that issues simplified output, including a score, classification, or recommendation that is used to substantially assist or replace discretionary decision-making for making employment decisions. So again, it's either being used to supplement or assist you know, the normal you know, human-based uh, decision-making process, or it's replacing a portion of that process entirely as, as you as employers make candidate uh, selection decisions. So some interesting uh, statistics uh, from our friends at, at SHRM on the use of AI from their uh, the recently issued State of the Workplace report. So at the time the report was issued, you know, their survey found that 25% of HR departments that participate in the survey currently use some form of AI in, 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 the, in the employment uh, decision-making. Uh, they also project that 26% of HR departments uh, who are currently using will start using AI at some point in 2024 or at a later date. And of the, the departments that currently use artificial intelligence, 42% of them responded that they currently use AI specifically for uh, talent acquisitions. So at some point in the recruiting, interviewing or, or hiring process. So it probably makes you ask the question, how exactly is AI, you know, you can, is it used in the, in the selection process? You know, we often see it being used it for purposes of recruitment or uh, candidate identification. So, you know, targeted advertising, candidate referrals, you know, you get those, you know, those, the, the, what we call the bots who uh, you know, target specific job openings to, to candidates on LinkedIn based on their LinkedIn profile and their credentials. I see, you can see AI used in, for candidate screening, where you're actually using an automated process to assist in application or resume screening, as well as potentially uh, provide initial qualification assessments uh, for a candidate based solely on their on their uh, written credentials. And we also see AI used in the interview process, where you know employers may use chatbots to actually conduct the interviews themselves or other automated interview processes, as well as potentially on a video interview, uh, you know use AI to perform a visual analysis of candidates, basically judge, you know, how they're acting, their interactions, you know, when, when they're responding to, to questions that are being asked. So from, from a legal perspective, how's AI currently treated under federal law? So President Biden issued Executive Order 14410 back in October of last year. And what this did is it, you know, set forth the administration's overall position that AI policies must be consistent with advancing equity and, and civil rights. And the executive order says that AI systems that are deployed irresponsibly have reproduced and intensified existing inequities, caused new types of harmful discrimination, and exacerbated online and physical harms to, to individuals impacted. So according to the Biden administration, you know, AI is presenting you know, an additional set of issues from a discrimination perspective that may not have been you know, uh, you know, touched upon uh, previously in, in a more traditional human-based 
decision-making process. So it really expands the web for potential areas of discrimination. The executive order also directs the Secretary of Labor to issue principles and best practice, practices for employers in the use of artificial intelligence and directed them to do so within 180 days or by basically by the end of this month. And what those DOL principles and best practices are expected to cover at a minimum are the job displacement risks and career, opportunity, career opportunities related to AI, including the effects on job skills and the effect on the evaluation of applicants and workers. So this suggests that, D, that there's, the DOL's concern and focus is going to be over how a, artificial intelligence will change the traditional concept of you know, being quote unquote qualified for a job and how that assessment by an employer is made. The DOL principles are also expected to address labor standards and job quality, including issues related to workplace equity, protected activity, compensation, health and safety implications of artificial intelligence in the workplace. As you can see, you know, these, these various topics touch upon you know, a number of different areas that are within the DOL's uh, investigative jurisdiction, as well as the jurisdiction of, of other federal civil rights agencies, as well as the NLRB. And finally, the executive order says these principles and best practices must address the implications for, work, for workers of AI-related collection and use of data about them, including transparency, you know, so providing notifications, engagement, management, and activity protected under worker protection laws. So as you can see, these, we expect these principles and best practices be, to be pretty all-encompassing in, in, in the issues that, that they address. Now. Our friends over the EEOC, of course, have their own take on the use of AI in the workplace. They've issued, in the last couple of years, they've issued two different guidance documents, specifically related to use of AI uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as uh, guidance uh, for AI use under Title VII. And both of these documents outline the EEOC's current enforcement position on how use of AI in employment decision making, including the hiring process, can run afoul of the ADA or Title VII. And in these, in these guidelines, the EEOC does warn that employers must be wary of using AI in a manner that quote unquote screens out qualified individuals with disabilities or has an adverse impact on workers in a particular protected class. And employers who use AI are also expected to comply with the uniform guidelines on employee selection procedures and ensure that any AI tools that they utilize are, are up to par under those guidelines. And what these guidelines apply whenever AI is used to make or inform decisions about whether to hire, promote, terminate, or take any other form of employment action towards applicants or employees. And they also require employers to take steps to assess if any AI has an adverse impact on a protected group. So basically the EEOC is saying, you as an employer, if you use it, you should be conducting adverse impact analyses to see if there's any disparate impact on you know, a protected uh, group of employees under you know, federal employment laws. Importantly, the EEOC also says that employers will be held responsible for their use of AI in employment decision making and any violations, even if the tool you're using is designed or even administered by a third party. According to the EEOC, basically they really don't care where you get it from. If you're using it, you're going to be responsible for compliance. And so they advise that employers, you know, when if they decide whether to rely on a third party to develop or administer an AI tool, you may want to ask that vendor at a minimum. You know, whether steps have been taken to evaluate the use of the tool, whether the use of the tool causes a sub substantially lower selection rate for individuals with a characteristic protected by Title VII. Basically, put the burden on the vendor to, you know, to prove to you that the validity of the tool and what, and as well as whether any you know, disparate impact issues have been identified in the tool's use. Uh, but the EOC is cautious to say if the vendor is incorrect about its own assessment and the tool when you're using it does, you know, result in either disparate treatment or disparate impact, you as the employer, because you're using it, are still going to be liable. So what are some other federal insights from AI use? You know, we've seen uh, guidance documents issued from uh, the Department of Justice, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the EEOC, and the Federal Trade Commission on, on enforcement efforts against discriminant by, discrimination, bias, and automated systems. And DOJ separately issued another guidance document on AI. Of course, the NLRB has an opinion on the matter. Uh, they issued a general Council memorandum in, in October of 2022, specifically dealing with electronic monitoring and algorithmic management of employees interfering with the exercise of Section 7 rights. As you can imagine, the NLRB is going to take a very aggressive approach when considering whether AI does interfere with an employee's exercise of their Section 7 rights. 
If you're a government contractor, of course, you have the OFCCP to worry about, where in the revised audit scheduling letter issued last year, item 21 is now specifically asking employers to provide information uh, about use of AI in the employment selection process. And hot off the presses, uh, it was actually issued last week, was a, a joint statement from pretty much every federal civil, li civil rights agency you can imagine on the enforcement of civil rights, fair competition, consumer protection, and equal opportunity laws and automated system. What this guidance document does, or the statement does, is it makes it clear that the enforcement authorities of each signatory agency apply to the use of automated systems and innovative new technologies just as they apply to other employment practices and other selection practices. So this is a pretty clear-cut statement of how the federal government is going to approach employers who use AI in, in, in the workplace and in employment decision making. So of course, you know, we still have to think about you know, state or local uh, restrictions. So currently, there are three different uh, local or state or local jurisdictions that have AI regulation on the books. New York City was the first uh, and has really kind of been at the forefront of this process. And then Illinois, the state of Illinois and the state of Maryland also have their own restrictions in place. Uh, now, the state of New York itself has its own uh, pending legislation, as well as California, Pennsylvania, Vermont, and New Jersey. So let's look at what New York City uh, talks about. So in, in the city, they prohibit employers within city limits or who are considering candidates within New York City from using, using what they call automated employment decision tools unless a bias audit is conducted. And they also require that specific notices are provided to candidates about the use of AI and the results of any bias audit. And so employers, you're ex expected to notify candidates if an AEDT will be used, as well as the job qualifications or the characteristics that that tool is going to assess. And then you as an employer, you're expected to engage an independent auditor to run a statistical bias audit, basically what we call an adverse impact analysis of the tool's impact on protected race and gender classes, and then publish a summary of the most recent bias audit results. And when they talk about using an independent auditor, New York City says, if you have a vendor who provides the tool, you can't have someone from the vendor run the audit. You need to engage someone separately, whether it's legal counsel or some other third party consultant to run this type of bias audit and, and, and produce the results that then you need to you know, provide information on on your careers page. Now, looking over, over to Illinois, under Illinois state law, the, what they call the Artificial Intelligence Video Interview Act, what this law does is it requires employers to notify candidates before a video interview that AI may be used to analyze the interview and decide on the candidate's fitness for the position. Employers are also expected to notify candidates of any other AI system that may be used in the hiring process, including a description of how the system will be used and what types of characteristics the system will use to evaluate candidates. And importantly, candidates actually have to consent before any AI system is used as part of their own uh, selection and candidate consideration process. So from a proposed legislation standpoint, you know, we are seeing some pretty uh, you know, recurring th common themes here. Both California and New York from a state law perspective are seeking to impose limitations on the use of AI uh, that are similar to those currently in effect in New York City. The state of New York will also require advanced notice to candidates if machine learning technology will be used to make hiring decisions uh, themselves. And the District of Columbia, as another example, their Stop Discrimination by Algorithms Act of 2023 prohibits use of algorithmic decision making in a discriminatory manner and again requires advanced notice to individuals whose personal information may be used by one of those, by one of those tools. So with the, you know, this developing state you know, and local legislation as well as federal guidelines you know, in mind, what, what are some of the key takeaways here? But what this, the legal movement shows is an increasing recognition that the use of AI tools in decision-making can have an equally disparate impact on protected classes as, as more traditional selection practices. And regulating AI is a new point of emphasis for the EEOC, the OFCCP, and other federal civil rights agencies. Uh, employers are expected to self-regulate their own AI use and take proactive steps to identify and correct any discriminatory practices. And if you wish to deploy or use AI tools in the hiring process, you need to be mindful of where it is being used and then your corresponding legal obligations. So what are some key questions to ask to wrap this up? You know, where are we, let's keep, one first question to ask is where are we currently sourcing candidates? Are we advising in jurisdictions that may have current or pending AI legislation? Similar questions you ask with respect to pay transparency, 
or, or uh, you know, the, the pre-hiring checks that, that, that might cover. Another question, are we currently using any hiring tool that can be considered AI or an AEDT? Do we know if we're using anything? And do we know whether it can be considered AI or an AEDT? And if the answer is yes, you know, what specifically are we using it for? What is that tool's role or function in our overall selection process? And to what extent does the AI tool replace or supplement human decision-making? If we use an AI tool, has it been, as we call it, scientifically validated, which is something that's generally required under the uniform guidelines whenever, whenever you use you know, some form of, of selection process? And finally, we need to ask ourselves, should we self-audit the tool's impact on our selection process? You know, what steps can we take to address any disparate impacts that are identified? So obviously, these are a number, a number of you know, important questions that we, that we should be asking ourselves and employers. And what these AI laws tell us is that much like issues relating to pay transparency, background te checks, and drug testing, you know, state and local laws are pay paying increasing attention to how these types of selection processes and hiring procedures are impacting candidates you know, potentially excluding protected groups from employment opportunities. You know, while the federal government is lagging behind a little bit on these issues, you know, the recent movement that we've seen from the various federal civil rights agencies strongly suggests that we're going to be seeing increasing regulation and enforcement of AI, you know, pay transparency and pre-employment checks and pre-employment checks under federal civil rights and, and employment laws. And so as employers, from an overall you know, wrap-up perspective, we should be mindful of these ongoing legal developments and use it as an opportunity to reevaluate and assess our hiring processes to ensure a legal compliance. So I know we're right at the end of our hour today and I covered a lot, a lot, of, a lot of topics. Um, I know there were, there were a few questions I were asking you know, throughout the presentation today. We, we will uh, follow up with you individually if you posed a question. But otherwise, I, you know, I would like to thank you uh, for, for attending the, the webinar here today. If you weren't on at the beginning, a, a copy of the webinar and the slides will be available and sent to, part, sent to attendees within 48 hours uh, after uh, we wrap up uh, here today. And again, if you have any questions that we weren't able to get to today, we will follow up with you. Or if anything else you know, comes to mind, you know, please feel free to contact Mike or myself or any other uh, member of our, our labor employment team. So I do thank you for uh, attending and participating today, as well as your patience with our technical difficulties. And we hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.